Hello and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with New Roll, the business podcast that brings the boardroom to you. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of New Roll. At this point, my marketing team suggested a lengthy piece on why more boards should be using New Roll to hire their next chair, non-executive director, trustee or board advisor. Rather than bore you with that, I'll cut to the chase. We're the market leader now in the board space, doing a thousand board placements annually. And we focus exclusively on non-executive appointments, giving us deep and current board search expertise. Our members tell us they want more roles. If every person listening now could send just one board role New Roll's way in the next three years, opportunities will increase exponentially for everyone. As the saying goes, communities grow great when people plant trees whose shade they will never know. Today's guest, Rory Campbell, is a founder, NED, chair, an accredited executive coach and strategic advisor with specialisms in purpose, engagement, and inclusion. He is a non-executive director at Newcastle Building Society, chair of Ignite Consulting, and independent member of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Alongside his non-executive responsibilities, Rory is also co-founder of New Vantage Consulting, where he works as a board and leadership advisor focusing on the delivery of leadership programs on purpose, engagement, and inclusion. He was formerly on the John Lewis Management Board and Senior Manager in Communications, Diversity and Inclusion at Lloyd's Banking Group. Rory, a huge welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Ollie. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> Rory, I've seen firsthand one of your superpowers, which is enabling conversations yeah. and creating an incredible safe space for conversations around difficult, sensitive topics. What, in your experience, enables the best conversations in boardrooms? Yeah, best conversations in boardrooms. You've got to have a really clear purpose for the conversation. I mean, we could have a lovely conversation about organizational purpose. I love that. But for great conversations, the conversation itself needs to have a really clear purpose. And that might sound obvious, but we so often either enter into conversations without a shared clarity on what we're trying to get to, what we're trying to work through, or we assume too much. We assume that each party shares the same view on the outcomes or the purpose of the conversation. I've always found it's helpful to be really clear on what the point of a particular conversation is, what we want to get out of it, where we're going, and to check in at various points to make sure we're on track for that because we all get distracted. The clarity of purpose, uh, uh, meaningful preparation, Sounds like a basic. Many of the people that will listen to this podcast will sit on boards, they'll read board papers. In fact, that's what I'm doing this afternoon. I'm reading board papers. So we think we're doing great prep, but often we don't give ourselves enough time. We don't give ourselves the space to really focus. And certainly for non-board meeting based conversations, we seldom properly prepare, partly because it seems in suddenly westernized businesses, we prize being really, really busy and doing and having an action-oriented mind. And we prize less the space to think and to meaningfully prepare what we think and what we consider and what we want to contribute to things. So having real time to prepare helps get the best quality out of each individual. And then when you align that with a clear purpose, then those two things come together beautifully well. And then lastly, I guess the last couple of things for me for creating great conversations... One is really taking advantage of a range of thinking styles. And I mean cognitive diversity here. Right? I mean people with different perspectives, different ways of working through a problem, getting energy and ideas from different sources that can help you see all angles on a particular matter, but also see beyond the boundaries of that matter to where innovation and creativity may be. So having a range of thinking styles, which clearly takes good facilitation to really bring the best out of all of those. And then lastly, something I often say is a safe environment without judgment. If you want to get the best out of people in any conversation, then you have to genuinely be open to their points of view. And we all naturally, for our own sense of psychological safety, hold our views back if we don't feel it's safe to contribute them, if we feel we're going to be overly judged. The clarity of purpose, meaningful preparation, embracing a real spread and diversity of thinking styles and approaches and making sure you have an environment where you're truly open to different perspectives without judgment so it's a safe environment for people to to contribute i think those are probably my keys for the best conversations in a boardroom love it and, and when you think of the, some of the boards that you sat on and you translate that into the the practical mm. things that 
boards have done that have either been good or bad on those fronts. Can you bring that to life with, with some examples? I'll, I'll give you a really, really practical example. This is going to sound quite basic, but it's one of those things that we often don't do. Take your average board agenda. You know, I would wager that most board agendas have a finite amount of time and give the tiny proportions of time to each item on the agenda. So we go into it not actually expecting discovery-oriented conversations, expansive conversations, but expecting quick decision-making, expecting people to have done the preparation because we're not actually creating the space to do any of that live thinking in the room. But one of the things we often fail to do is to be really clear what each agenda item is trying to achieve. What's the outcome we want from each agenda item? And I don't just mean approval or for discussion. I mean approval of what? Discussion of which particular points? What is this strategically serving? Why is this, frankly, even on the agenda? And I think you can easily solve that in two ways. One is the agenda itself. The best agendas I see for boards don't just list the item and the time. They also have a column that lists the purpose of that agenda item and the outcomes that are needed. So everyone knows for each item where we're going. And then the second is the papers themselves. We might call it an executive summary, but often an executive summary just becomes a slightly abridged version of the longer form. It should orient the conversation, you know, give purpose and, and clarity to what's needed in the discussion. So those two things in a very material sense. And then in a more facilitative perspective, how we facilitate conversations really matters. And this is where I think the role of the, the chair is super powerful. You know, a chair who is able to sit back and notice how conversations are flowing through the board, who's contributing more, who's contributing less, what perspective of our thinking is not being brought to the table, and to frame not just a conversation, but the structure of a particular item around that. So if I give you an example, if you know that you want to have a very forward-facing strategic discussion but there is a tendency of the board to be very operational, very facing the past, right? Looking at what we have done and less looking at what we are going to do in the future. You have to think credibly about how you create an environment that brings the future into the room. And that might be by having a specific five minutes even where you just cast your minds forward. We're going to talk about our strategy and what our current indicators tell us about our ability to achieve our strategy. But let's just take ourselves forward and remind ourselves what that future vision looks like. What will we be doing when we're in that position? How will that be working for us? And therefore, we can come back into the discussion with the future in our mind. So those are some, some, some practical ways for you, Ollie. Really, really helpful. I found myself spending a lot of time thinking about what is the purpose of a discussion in person. We made a shift as mm -hmm. a business a couple of years ago now to a much more narrative format, modeling ourselves on some of the insights that Amazon have shared or mm. people writing about Amazon have shared because we found that that narrative format allows for asynchronous exchange. It allows for those people who don't on the mm -hmm. spot so well to have time to reflect. It creates more balance for the introverts versus the extroverts. It has loads of advantages yeah. and it allows us to disseminate that information and <coughs> we're using Google Docs, make that information available to everybody without needing to rehash mm. it. And so it's forced us to think a lot more about what is the purpose of us meeting in person? And I sometimes mm. wonder whether boards give enough thought to that. What, why do we meet as a board in person? And what can we do in an offline, written, asynchronous format? What do you think is the benefits or the the times when conversations are best enabled in person versus running them asynchronously? There's one thing that, that really puts my mind before I give you some specifics that I think are really important about the times we come together. The one thing it puts in my mind is how often we do things out of habit. Mm. We meet in person or we meet offline out of habit without taking the time to think what's the best medium for the purpose that we're seeking. So I think that's such a good point, Ollie, about really taking the time to think about the purpose of our conversations and therefore structure them accordingly. I mean, fundamentally, when you do a asynchronous communication, it's going one way, broadly speaking. You may have emails or chat forums that allow people to respond, but broadly speaking, it's a broadcast. What you struggle to 
get in those sorts of forums is a sense of how much meaning and how aligned the meaning is that others have taken from those communications. So for me, coming together is really important for sense checking meaning and mean making itself aligning. It's particularly powerful when you're navigating complexity. I mean, you know, you'll know this more than me, Ollie, with all the businesses that they're all support, but I don't meet a single business or a single leader at the moment, for that matter, that thinks their world has gotten any easier, any less complex or complicated, any more certain. And in those times when we know less, and I say that with weight, because in my worldview, most executives, certainly in Western businesses, have grown up in a time, been educated in business, practiced in business, where as an executive, they're prized for knowing, for having a level of certainty in more stable environments than the business environments tend to seem today. So when you're working with that uncertainty and that volatility in really complex environments, it's really important to learn together. And it links back to that diversity of thinking. We've got to get over ourselves. I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm an expert of my own head. I'm not an expert of anybody else's head or an expert of all the things that we might come to when we work together. So having a conversation where we bring people together can help us have the purpose of navigating complexity in a far more coherent way that aligns us much better. And then the other thing which is so important for boards, and particularly, I'd argue, for non-executives who are clearly, by definition, occasional visitors to a business, right? It's building relationships. I like boards that are prepared to have the tough conversations, to you know, really argue it out if needs be in the room, but leave with consolidated positive relationships. And that only happens because they build up a level of trust, a level of understanding of each other. They know the way each other thinks. They have the safety to challenge each other, you know, to say, I think you're so wrong on that point. Let me explain why. And to build each other's perspectives. But we don't do that well when we don't have a relationship with people. So coming together, I think, is, is arguably the most important reason for bringing people physically together and you just can't build that quality of relationship in that asynchronous and that asynchronous way that you describe is that answering your question i think i've I've answered your question yeah it does i want to challenge it a bit (laughs) one of my favorite quotes is great the greatest challenge um, of communication is the illusion that it's taken place (laughs) and i sometimes wonder whether we, we assume a lot of communication has taken place. There are all those stats around whatever it is. 95% of communication is not verbal. It's physical, uh, visual, whatever it is. And I wonder how much that's really happening. Like, yes, people are taking that communication, but are they really aligning themselves? And to give you one example, one of the things that I've really liked about moving a good chunk of our interactions online is the ability Mm -hmm to get everybody to write down their thoughts and then share it Mm. at the same time in a chat stream Mm. because you Mm. avoid different people influencing. Whereas I guess the classic mechanism in the boardroom is often people will go around the table and they might start with the sort of the introverts Mm. first and then come to those whose opinions uh, are going to be most loudly heard. But one of the things I've often seen go wrong in boards is it's the people who talk most or talk loudest that will tend to then direct the conversation and i often mm. see mm. ceos find their topics get completely derailed as a result because someone has some particular axe to grind what, what, what do you see of in-person conversation mm. enablement to overcome mm. those derailers and yeah. miscommunication i couldn't agree more right we think we're communicating a lot but if we think about communication in its fullest sense It's not done until someone has received and understood the signal that was sent. And on that, we also have to recognize a bit of an engineering term, the distinction between signal and noise. We we think we're communicating when we send out signals, but those signals are landing in in an awful lot of noise. And, you know, just as, as an aside, I used to love the days when I was at John Lewis, when I would go out and spend a day on the front line. Pretty much every month, I'd go and spend some time in a shop or a distribution center or a contact center. And it was part of my capacity to talk to the teams and get a real sense of what was going on and what they were thinking. And the distance between what the board thought had been communicated 
and what people on the ground were paying attention to was, you know, as wide as you might imagine it to be. And when you think about it, practically, it makes perfect sense. I'm in for a four hour shift. I've got to restock that and move that. We've got a load of customers in because it's peak season. That's not working. The till's gone down again. I need to go and restock that. I'm trying to find this for that customer. Do I really care about what the next latest strategic missive is from the top today? I probably don't. And if I did, I'm probably going to be asked by some members of my leadership team why I'm not focused on the job at hand. So one of the hacks, if you will, is to do the thinking about the context into which we are communicating. Right? Let me say that again. Do the thinking about the context into which we're communicating. If I am communicating from upon high to a mass frontline audience, I have to think about the reality not just of the means of them receiving that communication, but the manner with which they're going to have the space and capacity to make sense of it. And frankly, what of what I want to say is actually relevant to what they need to hear in order to give their best to, to the organization. At a board level, I come back to some of the real importance of the way we facilitate. Can, can I give you an example, uh, Ollie, of two different boards, different managing director CEOs, and they're very different approaches and implications of those approaches. So board A, a seasoned managing director, seriously well-respected, one of those rare beasts that can hold the big strategic visionary picture but also nail you on the 0.03 percent margin miss right can cover the whole the whole gamut he had led this business through a period of time that i would argue was less volatile than the time we're in now and where actually the business model was relatively straightforward and i'm not demeaning any of the amazing growth that he drove through that business. You know, that was real passion and energy and, and commitment. But because things were relatively stable, and relatively known, that was a time when you could have a three to five year plan and be pretty confident that it would look like that. He tended to lead in a very boundaried way. So because he had a good degree of comfort that wherever this conversation went, it would land where he already was. Great. But when he didn't think it was going to land where he was, he'd take option B. And option B was either to say, I don't think this is much of a discussion, I mean, I think the answer is this, this, and this. Or he'd go to someone that he knew was already on side with his point of view, have them talk for five minutes, and then pretty much say, does anybody disagree with that? So it became this very almost binary board in that sense. You either agreed with, with the MD or you didn't, or you basically didn't get the opportunity for a full discussion on it. It didn't diminish the performance, but what it did diminish was the involvement of the board. Uh, I would argue they perhaps weren't as forward thinking for increased volatility over time as they could have otherwise been. Contrast that with another board, same sector, same industry, a similar environment, far more volatile times, and a relatively new managing director, well experienced in that business, frankly had grown through that business from graduate to the top. And her approach was very different. You know, she took a very collaborative, collegiate approach. She never had the mindset that said, I have the answers and I've determined them in advance. So are we all aligned with what I think? You know, she would pretty much start board meetings or agenda items with, let's have a discussion about what we think about this. Where do we want to land to? So a much more democratic, almost consensus-driven driven route. They both have pros and cons, right? The latter is a bit slower. And at times when you needed a really strong hand on the tiller and a really clear sense of direction, a little less consultative, you know, wanting a consensus isn't always going to get you there. On the flip side, the much more directive approach really drove pace, drove outcomes. But I know firsthand that board was not as engaged as he thought. So thinking how we chair a board, how we generally hold our own views as our own views, to be evolved and adapted by the collective input always, in my mind, make the outcome better over the long term. So is that helpful? Yeah, really helpful. I want to move on to talk about diversity. Mm -hmm. And one of my areas for development at the moment is to become more challenging in these uh, <laughs> podcast discussions. 
So I'm going to try to be challenging. It doesn't come mm. particularly naturally. First question up is mm. what are the toughest challenges with diversity in your mind? Mm, tough challenges with diversity. <laughs> yeah, good job. <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> what are the tough challenges with diversity uh, at the moment? So I'm going to give some fairly obvious answers and then I'm going to give some answers that I think are less obvious and arguably maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, I think the obvious answers are how honest we're being as businesses. And I don't mean about our levels of diversity, I mean about our reasons for being interested. Right? It matters to me at a professional level and it matters to me at a personal level. I'm the father of mixed race children, you know, their lives and their experiences matters to me. So I have my reasons, but I work with a wide spectrum of, of organizations who are unclear of their reasons. And that creates a problem even for those that are doing, have a good baseline of diversity and equity and inclusion activity, their policies are robust, their their recruitment is appropriate, they're doing everything you'd expect. But when you ask the board, as I do, I'm that guy that asks the awkward questions, if you ask the board, why are you doing this? And you filter out the, because we have to, they don't have a compelling reason. Sometimes they don't have a compelling reason. And the reason that's a, a, a problem, Oli, is because I see more organizations that are transactional in their approach to diversity and are driving a plan that has a number of years to it and don't really know where it's taking them. Then I see organizations that are driven by a sense of ambition or strategy or purpose. What do we stand for as a business and how does this help us achieve that in a way that meets the needs of all of our stakeholders? Right. So I think that's really challenging for, for most boards to get into. I think it's really challenging for my second reason, which is for most, this is an unfamiliar, uncommon and uncomfortable topic. Right. We don't typically or we haven't historically typically engaged with this topic around the board table, either because it gets delegated Right. Oh, that's the chief people officer. Well, they've got a senior lead for, for diversity. I don't have to think about it. How's our gender pay gap? Good? Right, I'll crack on. Right. So it doesn't really get the engagement at, at that level. And then on a very personal level, this is a topic that individuals find uncomfortable, either because of the former reason I've given. Executives are often paid to know, and this is a territory in which they don't necessarily know, and or because we have to confront some a personal points of view, and I don't judge those points of view, but we have to engage with our points of view, and that can feel exposing and uncomfortable. So creating first the individual comfort to engage in the topic, and then second the collective comfort to engage in the topic is, is really, really important. If I'm a bit more controversial on this, whilst I say businesses need to be clear on their reason for doing this, I think there's an overwhelming number of businesses that are doing this to be seen. Right. It's we used to call greenwashing, didn't we? When we think about the climate agenda. You know, one might call this woke washing. Right. There's a degree of we have to present ourselves a particular way and therefore that's what I'm gonna do. I'll give you a really naff parallel, right? I I go and present I have speeches, I'll go and present at workshops and things, and I'll typically wear a blazer and a shirt. You know, when I'm not doing that, I don't typically wear a blazer and a shirt. Why do I wear a blazer and a shirt? Because I feel that's a pro- more appropriate way of presenting myself in that forum, right? And we do the same as businesses. We put on a particular shirt and tie as a business to present ourselves to the outside world. And as we all know, sometimes what's really happening in the business is a far cry from what, what it appears to be on the outside. So we're presenting, we're projecting what we think the market, the stakeholders, the investors, the potential employees, the public, the regulators want to see without really being genuine or committed to it. And I think it's challenging for lots of boards to be more honest than that. And actually, I think they'll get caught out. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it's not difficult to spot them. (laughs) It's, It's really not. So they, I think, over time have a decision to make. You either close the gap by making your reality and your beliefs closer to what you're projecting, or you adapt what you're projecting to be closer to your reality. Right? And, I, and I think there's quite a few that have to face into, face into that reality. That was a long-winded answer, Ollie. Did it make sense? It did. It did. And, and incredibly rich. So I want to talk about <laughs> a bit welcome. more about DI 
best practices on boards. Mm. But before I do that, I want to throw you a, a challenging question. And I think you were kind enough to give me this as a challenging question <laughs> while we were speaking earlier. I'm going to regret what, it. I know I am. <laughs> what, what makes you an expert in diversity, Roy? Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> what makes me an expert in, in diversity? Well, first, I take issue with the word expert. Uh, here's a controversial thing to say. <laughs> here's a controversial thing to say. For me, experts are people with really deep, perhaps tenured experience in a field. And whilst, I mean, I worked at Lloyd's, I was senior, senior manager for communications for diversity and inclusion in 2010. Right. So this field is not new. Of course, it's not new. It's been around for a long, 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 long time. But it has exploded in the last few years for all the obvious reasons. And all of a sudden, you can't move for chief diversity officers and senior leads of diversity and so on, proclaiming their expertise. I don't think I'm an expert in diversity. What I'm an expert in is helping leaders to navigate tricky conversations. I mean, that's what I do for a living, right? Whether that's with coaching or whether that's with board facilitation work, or indeed, if I'm just delivering leadership development on a range of topics, what I'm really doing is helping those leaders to grow, navigate, acquire skills about something which is tricky. For me, I have really leaned into my personal interest and my professional interest in, in this space. So I wouldn't say expert, but I would say experienced. And I would say with considered thoughts and insights that are perhaps more developed than most others because of the time I've spent investing in it and thinking about it and uh, reading about it, studying it, researching it and so on, putting it into practice, seeing what does and what doesn't, doesn't work. So I take issue with the word expert. But what gives me the viewpoints and the positions I have, some of it is deeply personal experience. You know, you try being my parents in the 60s, being immigrants from Jamaica in the UK, having bricks thrown through your window. You know, you grow up learning a thing or two about how you're viewed as other. My career at various points, I've seen the real positive outcomes from inclusion, from Lloyd's Banking Group making some significant changes to its business banking proposition in the early 2000s, entirely in response to discovering that whilst it was both the largest business bank for, uh, for, uh, for SMEs, it had a declining share amongst Asian businesses. And the simple reason at that point in time was it lacked an understanding about Asian businesses. And when Asian-led businesses came in to see the business banking manager, there was a cultural mismatch and the two couldn't understand each other. Right? And a whole bunch of inappropriate assumptions and microaggressions and all that sort of stuff. But what I saw Lloyd's do was respond so positively. And I was a part of seeing that firsthand and ultimately a part of creating things inside the organization to help it get ever more inclusive in its commercial outlook as well as its internal outlook. And then over the years, I have, as a leader, engaged with this. And I say as a leader first rather than as a diversity person or a black guy, right? I've been a board director in a retailer where actually it's been part of my responsibility to think about how we bring people together and how we get the best out of people and help people to be at their best. And that, to my mind, involves dealing with human beings. Not men, not women, not black, not white, not disabled, not heterosexual, homosexual, human beings and embracing them for all, all that we are. And so I've always been curious and inquisitive at that personal level. And in these last five years, I've developed some very specific frameworks which are really about engaging in those deliberative conversations that we were talking about and i found that it's a super powerful way of helping boards and executive teams navigate topics like this and i learn so i treat this as continued learning there you go there's my non-expert answer well, I certainly consider you as an expert. You've been hugely thought-provoking and influential in shaping my own um, thinking and always hugely value my conversations with you. You wrote a piece around the sort of seven themes and three underpinnings which define great practices mm. for organizations that are best in class, I suppose, in the arena of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um curious to mm. hear you just bring those to life with sort of practical examples yeah where should we go the three underpinnings or because there's seven there's a lot to go with the seven underpinnings seven themes themes. sure so one of the 
genuine pleasures I, I have, Ollie, is being in and out of different businesses, different sectors, different levels, talking to the top table, but also you know, getting into the meat of the business and all the veg of the business, if you think, and seeing what's really happening. And what I have seen is that businesses that make sustained progress in this territory, and by sustained progress, I mean if you took the plan away, they would still be progressing. They would still be moving in this territory. It has become more how than what. Uh, and so their maintainment momentum, and linking back to what we spoke about earlier, they usually associated it with something that gives it a longer term view. What I found is that those firms uh, and those leaders within them do any number of the following seven things. They treat it as continuous work. That's number one, right? So, And these aren't in any order, by the way. They treat it as continuous work. It's not a, a milestone to reach and then the work is done. There's no expectation that the work here will ever be finished. Right? Does that mean uh, that it's on the, every board agenda? Or what does that mean no, practically? Um, it, yeah, great question. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean it's on every board agenda, but what I would argue is it, it means that it's an ever-present theme. What the hell does that mean? Practically, in terms of board agendas, you know, you'll be familiar with the, with the sort of board business cases that come to the table that have a section that says diversity, and you're meant to write underneath it, we consider diversity in this business case. I, I don't think I've yet seen that used meaningfully anywhere. It becomes a bit of wallpaper in reality. What it really should be doing is nudging the thought, making sure that as an organization, as a board, when we're reflecting on matters, in the same way that we don't need a nudge every month to think about, am I considering our overheads? Am I considering our revenue generation? Yeah, to think about, you don't need a prompt for that every month because that's core to your business. This being in the fabric of how we work, are we creating the culture that's most able to deliver our outcomes? with inclusion being a part of that, is more, is more what I'm thinking here, Ollie. Of course, there is a regularity to bringing that to front of mind. So I seldom see it appearing every month. I don't think the engagement or the quality of conversation is yet in that place where that would prove to be a useful exercise. I actually think it would be of diminishing value. I think it would turn to wallpaper very quickly. But what I do see is substantive discussions regularly, quarterly or twice yearly, a deeper dive that talks about how are we doing, what are we aspiring to, where are we looking to get to. Get to. The other thing I would say about continuous responsibility, and it links to one of the other points about personal responsibility. So one of my themes is that leaders take personal responsibility for keeping their perspectives up to date. The build on that for boards is it's not the chief people officer's responsibility. It's everyone's responsibility. You know, this isn't about a HR plan. This is about an organizational capability to engage its people, to engage its stakeholders, to contribute meaningfully to its purpose. So that personal responsibility is both about me having responsibility to make sure I understand what this means in today's world and what this means in my business. But I also understand it's my responsibility when I sit around the board table for this to be in part of my thinking. So when, when work, you think personal responsibility, yeah, and, and, and just thinking about when you think about sort of requiring positive cultural conditions and evolving the outlook of their leaders mm. as a board member, mm. what's it my responsibility to do? Is it to sort of you know I don't know taking your CEO to places they wouldn't otherwise have been, or uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> what what do, what do you? Yeah. So, so what, what does it mean? And then, and then practically, uh, what am I doing? And what do I advise others to do? Uh, so practically, it really just means that this agenda isn't static, right? Even if I take myself, it's, uh, it's really easy for people to look at me, right? See a middle-aged black man and therefore make some assumptions about my experience as a black man. But I can tell you firsthand, my experience as a, as a young black man is very different from my experience now. And I look at my children and what they perceive, receive, and hope for in terms of their experience navigating the world as mixed-race children is very different from my experience and my perspective. Uh, so I have to proactively engage with their experiences. My ask my daughter, what does it mean to her? You know, what sort of experiences is she having? And there I'm listening, right? I'm not applying my judgment or my perspective 
I'm actually just listening. I'm gathering insight so that I can add more data, if you will, into my mental data warehouse to inform my views on this agenda. I mentioned trans rights. You know, none of us had a conversation about, about trans rights 10 years ago. They barely knew what it was. Whereas now we do, and it's important for our organizations, it's important for our societies, and people have some very different views on it. So evolving our understanding and then asking ourselves organizationally the important questions of what does this mean for my business in terms of our responsibilities and our ambitions. One of the things, Ollie, this is such a simple thing that I recommend to just about every board that I, that I work with. And the ones that do it, without fail, tell me how much value it's given them, is reverse mentoring. Right? And simply put, find someone who is not like you and go and be mentored by them. You don't mentor them, they mentor you. We did this at, at John Lewis's board. It was wonderful. I was mentored by a lady called Kaylee. She was in her early 20s. She was up in contact center up in Glasgow. Very different background, very different walk of life, clearly very, very different hierarchically, socioeconomically, etc. And you merely have these moments interspersed through your calendar where you see the world from somebody else's shoes. It is unbelievably eye-opening. It closes gaps and grows understanding. And then here's the Brucey bonus for those of us that are old enough to remember Bruce. Uh, here's the Brucey bonus uh, on this. You get business insight that you would not have got in any other way. And it links in some respects to our earlier conversation about communication, right? You, you, you hear what really matters, how they really see the world. The managing director at the time, Paula Nichols, you know, she was partnered with a first line manager of you know, first management in one of the John Lewis department stores. He was a young Muslim guy. And for Paula, that was really rich experience, understanding the cultural differences, the way he viewed his work there, what it was like for him stepping into management for the first time. Because for most of us, I would wager every single one of us listening to this podcast, it's been a long time since we were first a manager, right? So that's what I mean by evolving our, our outlooks. You have to engage with the new data about the things that we are looking out upon because we form our views quite often based on old data, our old data. So you bring it up to speed by bringing some fresh perspectives. Oh, brilliant. So much food for thought there. Roy, I could keep uh, talking to you forever. Unfortunately, the time has flown by. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's time to move into right. our What's six that? question quick fire. Uh, where I'm going to say a Ooh. short statement and ask you for a quick response if you're ready. Okay, it's like a game show. I'm ready. So first up, best book every board member should read mm -hmm. and why? Time to Think by Nancy Klein. It is a book about listening, essentially, and thinking. And you should read it because, typically speaking, what we all do in every walk of our life when we think we're listening is we're just taking turns. And yet... When we meaningfully and powerfully listen, we learn more uh, and the quality of thinking of the other person is far higher. So I use time to think personally. It's also a practice I bring to lots of the work I do. So everyone should just go read time to think. So you know, it's an easy light read. Amazing. Interestingly, Promise That Changes Everything was the previous recommendation. So Nancy Klein featuring a high. Nice, there you go. You are Nancy Klein. Um, <laughs> Favourite quote and why? Oh, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go deep here. So I'm someone that throughout my life has struggled with depression. And the first time I struggled with depression, I saw a counsellor, a lady called Angela Markham, who forever will hold a place in my heart. And when I was at my lowest, I sat in her room overlooking Clifton Suspension Bridge. It was beautiful. And she leaned forward and she said to me, Rory, always run to, never run from. And that has always stuck with me. And the idea behind it is that when you run from things, you spend most of your time looking over your shoulder at the thing you're trying to get away from. You've got no idea where you're going. Whereas when you choose to run to something, you're mindful, you're thoughtful about where you're going, and quite often it slows you down. So for me on a very personal level, I was at the sort of point where I was ready to quit everything. I was living in Bristol, I was going to quit Bristol, everything was wrong. And actually, I slowed right down. 
and took the time to figure out where do I want to be? Where do I want to go? How do I want to be? So it, it is the single piece of advice that I literally give to everybody in, in my life to always run to, never run from. I love that. Thank you. Amazing. Your most significant professional insight? I think it's that the skill of discovery-based non-judgmental conversations is not common and yet it's a route to unlocking greater contribution connection creativity and yet it's something that you can plan for you can learn it you can structure the conversations for it and i think the moment i realized that the quality of my contributions and conversations got better because i changed my approach i'm a big believer that you change yourself first and then when I contribute to a board or a chair on a board, that's what I'm trying to create. You know, the ability for us to stand in the future, discover our path, hear each other without judgment. Yeah, so discovery-based non-judgmental conversations, I think. Your favorite podcast? I'm going to go with Work Life by Adam Grant. I really like Adam Grant. I'm a bit of a closet psychologist, so he really appeals. I like both his storytelling because he really brings things to life beautifully. And I also leave with great, useful, practical insights that I can apply pretty much immediately. So yeah, Work Life by Adam Grant. Love that one. That's one of my favourites too. Mm. Three things that listeners should take away if they take mm. nothing else. <laughs> if you take nothing else, take this. Have an ambition. So if you want to make long-term progress, particularly in spaces like, in, like inclusion, but frankly, more broadly speaking, you could argue the same for transformation, for climate change. If you want to make long-term, deep progress, you need to be ambitious and have an articulated ambition. Know what you're aiming for. That binds people together. So have an ambition. I think listening is a superpower. And the thread that's run through everything that we've spoken about, is, you know, right at the heart of conversation, you said it at the outset, it's either all out or it's out and in. And you only know that communication has worked when someone has received, and that involves listening. So for me, us all getting better at that superpower of listening, I think is the second thing. Um, the, the last is linked to that ambition, but it's a slightly different take on it, which is to routinely stand in the future. Right? Take your board on a trip to the future regularly. And then walk back and discover what your business will need to do, how you'll contribute so that it thrives for that future. I think sometimes we plan out. The world is too volatile. This is why when I run sort of either transformation or, or help organizations to think about their purpose, I talk about constellations, not North Star, right? Because you, when you start out, you just need to make sure you're going to land in that constellation. Because on the way there, you're going to get detoured right <laughs> deviated if you aim for a star you might not hit it but you'll still be in the right place if a constellation and i think this trip into the future is a bit like that stand in the constellation look back at your world and say what did we have to build to get here brilliant Rory, it is always such a treat and pleasure to talk with you i'm well, so um, pleased that uh, can share the uh, privilege of that with uh, all of the uh, podcast listeners thank you so much for taking the time my absolute pleasure. I, you know, likewise, Ollie, I always enjoy our conversations, thought for broken. And uh, yeah, I felt quite challenged by some of those. So nice work. And thanks to all of you listening. We've been blown away by the incredible feedback about how this podcast has been helping you get board roles and become better board members. This podcast is for you. So if you'd like to suggest guests, topics, difficult challenges, or you'd like to share stories about how the podcast has impacted you, or have suggestions on how we can improve, please email podcast at neural.com that's podcast at neural.com and let me know i'd love to hear from you otherwise thanks again for listening and look forward to having you back here for the next discussion